Okay, thanks for coming, everybody. Yeah, I'm going to be talking about New Caledonia today, and uh, he's kind of sold my, sold, sold my thunder a bit by showing you this, the, the, next, the second slide, because if you, even if you haven't heard of New Caledonia and don't know where it is, you've probably seen this. Um, anyone not seen this before? It's in a famous book called The Earth from the Sky. Um, and this is called The Heart of Vaux, and it's actually a natural phenomenon. Um, it's a mangrove swamp uh, in the sort of northeast of New Caledonia, not that far from uh, where I'm going to be talking about, although you can't actually really see it properly unless you're either in a plane or on the, on the high mountain, which is not too far, which I haven't been to. Okay, but just to, to put it in a bit of context, um, I'll come back to that in a minute. So, where is New Caledonia? It's in the Pacific. Um, it's about 1,500 kilometres northwest, uh, sort of west of Australia, northwest of Australia. Um, and it's long and thin. It's 500 kilometres long, only 50 kilometres wide. That's the main island. There's a, 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 a few odd islets around the side as well. Um, but I'm going to be talking about the main island mainly. Um, and population is about a quarter of a million, more or less, uh, as estimated uh, in July this year. Um, of whom 44% are indigenous people, so they have a built-in minority um, status in the population as a whole. Europeans, nearly 35%, and others, uh, mostly from the Pacific area, um, make up, um, well, whatever it is left. <laughs> um, and these people come mainly because it's uh, got a relatively uh, well-to-do economy compared to other areas in the, in, the, in the Pacific and also because of its industries. Politically, it is part of France, though, um, and that has been um, what the, these overseas territories, as French, the French call them, since 1956. Um, but there's quite a lot of history to do with France before that. Um, again, here's um, where it is. Uh, it's not actually north, north, north it's, it's west of in Australia. Um, this doesn't really give, this, is, this shows you where it is, and it shows that there's a huge expanse of Pacific Ocean around it, but it doesn't really show it in its relation to the other islands in the Pacific. Pacific. So I thought I'd show you this map as well, which shows some of the other ways. You can see Wallace and Futuna, where quite a lot of people come, Vanuatu, as it's pronounced in, in New Caledonia. Um, what's interesting is, although the nearest um, places to New Caledonia are really kind of Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, Vanuatu particularly. Um, New Caledonia, because it's French and therefore francophone officially, tends to relate to other francophone ter territories in the, in, this, in the area, or not so much in the area. So when you watch the evening news in New Caledonia, you get uh, Polynesian news, meaning news from Tahiti, which is actually quite a long way away. So you can't see, okay, over here. You get a little bit of Vanuatu news, a little bit of Wallace and Fortuna news because, as I said, there are quite a few people from Wallace and Fortuna in New Caledonia. You get very little news from Australia and New Zealand. You wouldn't know they exist. And, of course, you get French news. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> Um, socioeconomically, uh, the main, main, main industry is nickel mining, and that's why a lot of people come from other places to work in that industry. Um, there's quite a lot of tourism as well, especially on cruise ships, so when you're there with uh, some kind of foreign accent like me, they assume you're an Australian from a, tour, from a cruise ship. And there's some fishing, there's um, some attempts to start commercial shrimp farming, uh, but there's also artisanal fishing. But interestingly, the local people where I was, in the north uh, east of the, of, of the main island um, aren't allowed to sell the fish that they catch. They're only allowed to give them away or swap them. Um, oh, by my hand, I haven't turned that here. Oh, oh, do you want oh, well, forget that. <laughs> okay. Um, um, and that tourism, a lot, of the, a lot of the tourists are interested in the World Heritage Site of, of the reef, the lagoon around New Caledonia, um, and also natural phenomena like the Heart of O that I showed you just now. But there is um, some, um, what's the word, um, not exactly conflict, but, con um, yeah, um, what's that word? <laughs> Tension. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, between, um, in fact, particularly tourists inter interested in environmental stuff and, and also the local people, the, the original indigenous people, the Kanaks, and the nickel-based economy. Um, because um, some of the techniques that are being used to mine nickel are not terrifically good for the lagoon. 
um, cultural survival here, this quote here, environmentalists and Canuck leaders alike are firmly against this particular company's proposed development due to its potential for environmental degradation. Okay. Um, also, there's a lot of subsidies in, to the economy from France. So France, I think, spends a lot of money trying to keep people in New Caledonia sweet. Um, and that's partly because there's due to be um, a, a referendum on independence next year. Um, and at the moment, there's a pro-French party in power in the local um, kind of parliament, uh, which is not really a parliament, um, um, but a sort of just a local sort of um, assembly. Okay, um, but there is a lot of urbanisation going on. Um, um, there's no um, post-secondary education outside the capital, so if anyone wants to go to higher, to further higher education, they have to come to the capital. And there's a lot of young people, um, as it says here, half the population is aged under 30. Um, so, um, particularly among the Canuck population, um, there's a lot of um, um, it's indigenous population. There's a lot of um, um, unemployment, um, educational underachievement, underachievement as well, um, which leads to a high level of drug use. Um, um, especially marijuana, they identify uh, quite a bit with, with reggae, um, partly because of traditional hairstyles. Um, dreadlocks are quite traditional apparently in New Caledonia, and the colours as well. Are, 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 um, um, they like they like the, the, the colours of the Kanak flag are quite similar to reggae colours, um, and and everywhere you go you hear reggae music. So so the culture of, of, of smoking marijuana is quite strong among young people. Um, and so you get quite a lot of road accidents and several people that I, I spoke to have been bereaved because of, of road accidents, um, because of drug use and alcohol use. Okay. Right, so just to say, they, they, um, this is a part from the UNESCO website about the World Heritage Site. Um, and this is from Cultural Survival's website about the coral reef and the threats to it from the nickel mining, if you're interested in that kind of thing. And here is that photo there in, in more detail because, um, I mean, you see, you see the extent of the reef around it. It's, it's, um, if you've never seen a reef, a reef from the air, it's really quite, quite something. Um, and about here is the area where the language is that I'm going to be talking about. Okay. Okay, so political background, as I said, um, colonised in France in the 1850s. Interesting, let's say the church, actually, the Catholic Church, who had already sent missionaries to New Caledonia, actually opposed colonisation and um, actually uh, sent the soldiers away when they tried to uh, um, establish a base near one of the, well, near the oldest church in the island. Um, um, but the, the colonisation led to land expropriation, reservations for the indigenous people. They, 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 they say that the only, only people are outside North America who are put in reservations. Um, okay, and it was also a penal colony for, um, for convicts from France. Um, so eventually, in the 1970s, 1980s, there were what are euphemistically called the events, uh, les événements. Um, um, a, um, a euphemism a bit like the Troubles in Northern Ireland, if you've heard of those um, in, in, in the United Kingdom. Um, and the Canuck people rose up against, uh, against the colonial government, um, particularly in the north, which is the region where I was. Um, and they, as, as, as that area was effectively out of government control, they established uh, what they call the Ecole called Popular Canuck, generally known as the EPK, the Canuck Popular Schools, um, which developed their own Canuck local indigenous curriculum, um, including stuff in and on local languages, um, local culture, local flora, fauna, etc. And I'm going to come back to that later because it's, you know, it, 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 people re remember that with, with great fondness people who went to the epic car and the church schools carried on going at, at, in parallel at the same time and people who went to the church schools said they were going to look over the fence and say, I wish I was at the epic car <laughs> much more fun anyway eventually um, there um, there were peace talks um, there was um, a, a leader of the indigenous movement called Jamari Chipao, I don't know if you've heard of him, um, almost like the Kanak Gandhi, and got assassinated in, in 1989 by pe people from his own side for being too moderate. But um, he was one of the main um, brokers of the peace negotiations. Um, and after the, the two accords, there have been staged transfer of powers. 
difference. Um, um, I think we're about, about on the fourth uh, step in transfer of powers from France to, to local control, but education and language policy have not yet been devolved, which is crucial for this particular talk. Um, and as I said, pro-French parties are currently in power, um, and as I said, there's a lot of inducements from, from the French. Um, some people say there's even free electricity, particularly in rural areas. Um, um, to, to, and, and, and a bit like the, the debate about Scottish independence here, a lot of talk about, oh, the, 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 this, the, the, the New Caledonia couldn't possibly support itself. Well, there are much smaller places than that that do support themselves, like some of the islands you saw on, on the map earlier, um, like Cook Islands, Tahiti, for example. Okay, which Titi is further, further along in the, in the step towards independence from France. Okay, so when we get to languages at last, um, French is the de facto official language, um, but there are also 28 living Kanak languages, some, some have now died out. Um, I'll, come, I'll show you a, bit, a map of the languages in a minute. Um, and there are also quite a lot of other languages, such as Fatun in Indonesian, Chinese, Javanese, Vietnamese, and so on, spoken by all the people who've come in to, to work there. Um, I'm going to be talking, obviously, about the Kanak languages here, the indigenous languages, um, which poorly... Um, uh, categorizes as badly behaved or aberrant Melanesian languages. I like badly behaved better than aberrant myself. Um, <laughs> what that means is they, they borrow a lot. Um, um, and they are in the Austronesian language family and um, they are related to, to, uh, to, um, Oceanic, to, sorry, to um, Polynesian languages. Um, in fact, the word kanak comes from Polynesian word for man, for person, kanaka. Um, people in Hawaii would recognize that word. But to hear um, 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 new kind of languages, you wouldn't know that they were related to Polynesian languages because they got a lot more phonology than Polynesian mm. languages, a lot of phonology. Um, and this is why they're called aberrant because they, they, just, they, they borrow a lot from, from neighboring languages. And so they have a high degree of phonological and lexical differentiation between each other. Um, and there's been extensive lexical borrowing between particularly the northern languages, I think to a large extent due to inter intermarriage. Um, it's quite traditional and common for people to marry someone from outside their, their, their area, particularly from an from adjoining area. Um, so there's a tradition of, of, of borrowing, lexical borrowing, language contact, dialect continua, so that people do understand neighboring languages to, to a certain extent, um, so into comprehensibility, and also a tradition of multilingualism and intermarriage, as I said, um, which again I'll come back to when I talk about perceived problems nowadays. What's interesting now, just to mention in passing, is that generally there's a lack of pigeonization. If you compare this to Papua New Guinea and Vanuatu, which are relatively close um, in the scheme of things, um, there you tend to find that most people speak a Creole, um, and the Creoles are the languages of wider communication, but that doesn't, hasn't really taken off in New Caledonia. There's one small uh, le French lexified Creole in the south, Teo, but generally um, French is used as, as the lingua franca. Okay, so French is the only language of education, literacy, public life. Um, languages taught in schools are English and very usefully Spanish. <laughs> Where's the nearest place you could speak Spanish to this? Long way away. Easter Island, yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is quite a long way away. Um, Kanak languages are generally not taught as subjects in schools apart from a very small experiment which I'll come back to later. Um, as I said, French is now the lingua franca, so there's little cross-community language sharing. Um, um, and the Catholic Church, the, um, the main island was, was, was mostly proselytized or Christianized by, by the Catholic Church, whereas the outlying islands, the Loyalty Islands in particular, tended to be um, Christianized by Protestant missionaries. The Protestants, um, as you may know, were quite keen on indigenous languages, quite keen on translating the Bible into, indig into indigenous languages. Um, but the Catholic Church um, 
saw indigenous languages as um, a threat, really, a threat and as a problem. Um, and people, all these inverted commas, they're quotes from people I talked to. The nuns used to hit our fingers with a ruler if we spoke our language, said someone that I, I spoke to. Uh, I'm, I'll show you a slide in a minute. Um, and Numea, because of the urbanization, people come to Numea from all over the island. This is the capital. Um, there's, and, and also most of the immigrants live in Numea. Um, there's a lot of linguistic diversity. Um, and I say people will speak to each other in French but not learn each other's languages. And this is seen as a problem uh, both by ordinary people and also by language planners. Okay, let's get more. Okay, so this is a quote from a report um, just over 100 years ago uh, by church missionaries. And my translation, as, as I explained to some of the students earlier, okay? Um, the indigenous language is so numerous, so different, so difficult to learn thoroughly. <laughs> yes. So we're just going to make them learn, learn French, which is no, more, no, more diffi no, no less difficult for, for indigenous people, of course. <laughs> um, lacking in expressions of Christian ideas. <laughs> oh dear. An obstacle to a clear and a simple explanation of our doctrine. So it's best to consider them a temporary stopgap until the younger generations educated in French have replaced the elders, um, which is yeah, still ongoing, I think. <laughs> but yeah, definitely everyone is now educated in French. Yeah. Okay. So here we have a map of New Caledonia. Um, so these, these colours are what they call the customary areas. Um, traditional um, customary areas. Um, there's something called a, a, a Kanak Canic Parliament almost, um, as a sort of or Canic Senate, and it's uh, where traditional leaders meet and well, pronounce on various things. I don't think it has a lot of power, but it has quite a lot of prestige among indigenous people. Um, indigenous people tend to be of the opinion, well, the people that I talk to, that the French are trying to replace traditional um, um, structures, societal structures, um, and they're quite keen on, on keeping what they call the chiefdoms and their traditional um, representatives. Okay, so I was in the, not mainly in the north, also went down, the Numea's capital is right in the south here. Um, it's a, it's a seven-hour bus trip right up round here, because in the, middle, the middle is mountainous, so you have to go right up to the north and then back down to Pueblo, uh, which is uh, the area I'm going to be talking out about mainly. Okay. Um, and you can see the outlying islands here, the loyalty islands. Okay, so Pue was in the Hutmawap customary area, uh, northern province, um, which is, um, as you can see from here, well, the most linguistically diverse area, um, and also the largest of the customary, or, or largest of the provinces at least, the modern provinces. Um, and the main language spoken in the town of Pueblo, I say town loosely, um, is called Chach. Um, and interestingly, they only count in the sense of speakers over the age of 14, which makes it quite difficult to, for a linguist to gauge the uh, linguistic vitality uh, because they're not counting children. Um, because that's not for people yet. I don't know. <laughs> um, so you have to go and ask people about that. And this is something that I was very interested in, to what extent is language shift taking place and what are the attitudes towards that. Um, and um, the... Pueblo, although its own language is relatively small compared to other languages around it, so if I go back here, oops, sorry, uh, you can see that, that this, sorry, this a very small area here, and two other larger languages, Jawi and Nyelayu, <laughs> to, uh, to the north and south. Um, um, but, but Pueblo is said to be seen as, as a centre, a very, again, a very loose term. Um, and school, and the, so children come to schools in Pueblo, uh, that is primary and secondary schools, from the outlying areas, which means that there are three language groups um, represented in the school. Um, and I, I, I did try and, and ask people particularly, is there mutual comprehensibility between Jawi and Nyalayu? Because um, this is perceived as a problem by teachers. Oh, well, if we speak in church in the classroom, uh, the other children won't understand, so we're just going to have to use French. Um, um, and I said, well, 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 well uh, th there is a, a, di a dialect continuum here. I know there is. <laughs> um, and I know there's been an, an intermarriage going on. Well, yes, yeah, they would understand, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> uh, there are lots of excuses for, for, for not doing this. Um, there's not all sort of blame. For, uh, there's not a lot of um, taking responsibility going on. Um, 
there's also a lot of rapid cultural shift going on. Um, the children seem to watch Disney Channel all the time, everywhere I went. Um, in French. In French, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, Disney's fairly comprehensively translated into French all the songs and everything. Um, yeah, so um, everyone pretty well that I, I could, I could as, as far as I could see, has satellite TV, um, has a car. Um, the, 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 um, the, traditional, the traditional way, and, and in the north people still live to a certain extent in the traditional manner in quite spread out um, communities. Um, both the individual homesteads and, and the, the, the community as a whole is quite, are, are quite spread out. And people in the past would walk or perhaps cycle between them. Um, but um, nowadays everyone drives in a car and, and, and together with the increased use of imported food that is leading, like here, to a bit of an obesity problem. Um, and everyone has mobile phones but there's not a lot of coverage. <laughs> there's, all, there's, no, there's no internet access in the north either there, and, and there's not a lot of of, um, of um, landlines, um, or, and interestingly, people don't seem to combine the satellite TV with satellite internet broadband. So basically, you can text people with your mobile phone, and you find the place in the house. The house I was staying in, there's a, a mark on the wall in the main bedroom where you hold your phone when you want to compose your text so that it will go. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> and it's very difficult to actually make a call because it, well, they won't stay within the, 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 the cell of, of the, um, the signal for that long. Yeah. Okay, and everyone has lots of running cold water but not a lot of hot water. But that doesn't matter a lot because it's quite warm. It's about 30 degrees, but it rains all the time. It's very difficult to dry your clothes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, this, this needs de deconstructing a bit, this, this picture, I think. So um, looks like a traditional hut. is more or less a traditional hut. Um, this is one of the buildings um, that this family um, have um, at their disposal. So uh, most people's homes have several buildings, and one would be a quite modern kitchen or bathroom, or relatively at least, um, and there'll be often a traditional style hut, and then there'll be sort of a, a, a fairly comfortable living area. Um, Okay, um, there may not be a modern kitchen actually, there may be a fairly very traditional kitchen um, with sort of um, um, a fire on top of um, sort of mud brick oven. Uh, quite, yeah, very quite interesting cultural um, juxtapositions there. Um, so here, here, here we see um, Danny. Didas, his wife, uh, the, the daughter Karine, who works as a community worker. She organises all the local farming and fishing cooperatives. Um, she's employed by the government. Um, this is um, this is okay. Yeah, this is Aurélie Cochard, who is uh, the linguist who was my host there, or, or kind of facilitating my trip, and I owe her a great debt for introducing me to all these people. Um, here, uh, what, what um, uh, Karine and, and Danny are leaning on, these are traditional doorposts. Um, they haven't yet been installed by, by the door, but they're obviously very proud of them. Um, and in fact, they, they set up this, this photo. Um, they said, oh, we, you've got to have a photo of us by, by the traditional hut. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's about, is it about it on that, I think, yeah. Okay, so in terms of language policy developments, um, there have been moves to um, improve attitudes towards uh, the indigenous languages. Um, and it was also recognised that the French that children were coming to school with was not terrifically good French, um, <laughs> um, because they'd been taught French by their parents who were second language speakers, um, and really not necessarily to support the indigenous languages, but more to improve the French of the kids. Um, the parents were, were in, um, well, there, there was, and no one could tell me exactly when this was brought in, about 2003, I think. Um, there was a policy encouraging schools to encourage parents to speak home languages, traditional languages, with their children before they went to school, so the schools would have the responsibility for educating the children in French. Um, and so it's a transitional model, not intended to support language maintenance. But they're, they're also, uh, they also started to employ language assistants in the schools who, who could um, like interpret for the children and help them to understand what was going on in the French, in the French language classroom. Um, 
Okay. But this somehow this new policy didn't get through to the parents. So parent, often a lot of parents still think that the children aren't allowed to speak home languages at school. And the children tell the teacher that they aren't allowed to speak charge at school. <laughs> So they come along with these um, ideas. Um, there's also a pilot project um, to teach a subject called Kanak Languages and Culture in schools. And this is about um, uh, rather than in, if you like. It's, it's a subject rather than, than uh, actually teaching the languages. A bit like a sort of um, language of, uh, awareness in, in, in some places. Um, and there's also now some kind of languages taught, again, as subjects uh, at the University of New Caledonia. And they've started a BA in, in Oceanic Languages, um, partly taught by, by Arlie's um, supervisor, um, um, uh, Claire, um, Claire Mel um, for, uh, furry, always furry, thanks. Yeah. Um, um, and there's also um, moves to have more place name signs in local languages. And I've got an example of one here. Um, you can see this is um, in French, it's called Saint Denis de Puebo, um, but um, the indigenous word the name is, is Tumwa. Um, and this is the, the parish name. Um, Okay, um, and what's interesting is that um, most of these, where are we, okay, most of these um, indigenous language signs tend to be rustic, either in colour or in materials or in the kind of font that they use. Often they use a kind of like a childish font, um, the kind of sort of ha childish handwriting font that you get on, on, on computers for, for the indigenous languages, which I think again sends a kind of subliminal message. Okay, where, where I took this photo, this is a kind of community centre, um, and in the community centre they have an after-school club, um, which is mainly sort of babysitting and, 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 and making tea and stuff, but in theory once a month they have a language maintenance exercise, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. There's also interesting you know, cultural here is, is the uh, post box, which you can see. Um, up on the right, you can see some, some houses. You can see they're sort of quite spread out. Um, there's a whole culture of interesting post boxes in, in New Caledonia as well. Anyway, um, asking people about um, language shift, perceptions of shift in New Caledonia, um, people think that children are shifting to French. Um, they say children apply in French when they uh, try to speak to them in, in church. Um, but you can see, if you look into it a little bit more closely, you can see sort of um, self-perpetuating circle going on there. Um, because parents think the children don't understand church or the, or the church words. Well, they don't know them yet. They don't understand them because they don't know them yet. So the parents speak to them in French to help them, and therefore the children don't learn the church words. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I talked to some of the teachers at the Catholic infant school, and children start school at age two years, nine months, which I think, poor kids, um, it's really a bit young. Um, but in the reception class, um, what the teachers said, that only one child out of 21 children in the reception class spoke church well. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit more about what they mean by speaking well. Um, and there were similar, the ALK here is the, the Language Academy, which I'll come back to in a bit, but there were very similar reports from people who went to the meeting I went to at the Language, language Academy. Okay. Um, and what, what happens nowadays is that, well, in, as I mentioned, in, that there, has a, there is a tradition of intermarriage. Um, but we, nowadays, if you get two parents from different language groups, they tend to speak French to each other and, and with the children, whereas in the past each parent would have spoken their own language or um, the mother would have spoken her own language until she learnt church, or until she learnt the language of her husband. And some people learn languages more quickly and more easily than others. Okay. Um, you also find there's quite a lot of code switching going on. Um, which again is actually quite traditional. As I said, there's, there's a tradition of borrowing um, and multilingualism in, in connect languages that people seem to have forgotten about. Um, so I, I spoke to um, some young people um, in the sort of late teens, early 20s. Um, these particular young people are members of a church youth group. Um, 
lovely, lovely, lovely young people, very, very nice, very helpful. Um, and they said things like we rarely finish a conversation all in church, and we often put French words into church, and we don't know why. Um, these, and they, um, um, very often people aren't aware of code switching, but they actually are, the, these young people. Um, but it's not necessarily a conscious choice. They say they don't know why they do it. But I, you know, you could, as a linguist, interpret that as natural use of all their whole linguistic repertoires. But it tends to be seen as something as negative, particularly by by people who criticise the language use of the young people, um, and say, oh, they don't speak church properly, you know, and, and therefore language shift is happening. Um, yeah. Okay, so people say things like authentic church is being lost, yeah? Um, the children speak deformed church. They don't speak proper church. Um, they use different words. Sometimes the words are influenced by French. Sometimes they're just different words. Um, a general language change as happens, as we know, as linguists, that you can't stop. Um, young people tend to use abbreviations. This is something that's kind of traditional in France as well among young people. Um, it, may, it may be something that's imported from French culture, it may not be, um, but that tends to be the case. Um, and also there's phonological change going on, perhaps influenced by French, but again this is quite normal for Kanak languages. They've traditionally always borrowed both lexis and phonology. Um, so one of the university students who is studying in, on the BA in the Oceanic Language, Languages course, who comes from Cuevo, said to me, this is a quote, he says, an old lady told me my way of speaking disturbed her. He said, there's a gulf between our generation and grandparents and we have to preserve the language by adapting it. Um, yeah. And so I think, I think that, was, that was quite insightful. Yeah, of course he's, he's a linguist. Okay, and this relates to some of the things that we're finding with other languages as well. This is a quote from a um, paper by, by a friend of mine um, saying, Why are children and learners both eagerly expected to learn minority languages, while at the same time often negatively evaluated in their actual practice of said, said languages? You know, it's, there's a, a bit of, again, a tension going on between what we want children to do and the criticism all the time of how they speak. Um, and therefore, you know, we're going we're gonna to actually forget about. About, about actually passing on languages effectively to children. Okay. Um, going back to language maintenance and revitalization, um, there is a local language committee and um, they talk about working on the language. Um, the people I stayed with and um, um, the sister-in-law, the woman I stayed with are on the language committee. Um, my sister-in-law was saying not many young people like herself, she's in her mid-twenties, um, are interested in, in language. Um, and I was interested, at, well, I, um, and they kept talking about working on the language, and I said, well, what do you mean by working on the language? What it means is that they, they collect words for a dictionary. And Noreli Koshar has been helping them with this, uh, because they really didn't have any idea how to do it. So she suggested um, that you start with a human body, here's a picture of a human body, um, so you collect words for that, and then you kind of move out from, from that to what humans need, how food's grown, that kind of thing, and then to things like place names, genealogies, um, kinship terms, which we've been talking about here, cultural traditions, which are very important um, um, ostensibly for people there. As I said, you also get animations uh, at the after school club. Um, um, and they try to focus on things like local history and customs because they're not part of the school curriculum. Uh, but again, this sends a subliminal message. You know, they're not important enough to be taught, um, like that Spanish, for example, or English. Um, they have nice activities like Easter egg hunts with clues in the local language um, with the added incentive of chocolate if you win, <laughs> um, though, though chocolate doesn't last very long in their climate. <laughs> um, but I asked, well, who has the ideas for this? Um, and the woman I stayed with, who's the woman who runs the after, all, after school club, said, well, the president of the association. It's a very much, very much a top-down model, like the farming and fishing so-called co-ops are actually run by, by governmental representatives. Um, and so despite or even because of perhaps this history of political activism and resistance to French rule, there's quite a strong paternalistic hand on, on language activities and also cultural, cultural activities. Okay, um, people have um, quite
quite strong feelings about, about cultural shift, not so much necessarily about language shift. Um, um, they don't necessarily see language and culture as the same thing. Um, they see them as interlinked. Um, and that is a quote here from someone in the village: uh, that the, the language is, t is disappearing and, and culture with it. And as they and um, Aurelie's quite it quite difficult to find people who can tell old stories, who know about the old traditions. Um, one of the people I interviewed actually done a, done an MA um, in cultural anthropology um, at the university there, and we're hoping me and Aurelie are trying hoping to do some more research with him um, 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 because they talk about children as being déraciné, uprooted um, and they talk about losing their identity um, and there's a lot of rhetoric ab about cultural shift um, um, but as far as I could tell this isn't necessarily um, accompanied by action and you get the same kind of thing with language revitalization all around the world. Um, they talk about language is all the most the last thing they have left because they've lost a lot of cultural traditions um, but some people still speak, well most people still speak the language, actually most children can still speak the language. Um, what my mother said to me was that children would speak church to each other but they wouldn't necessarily speak it to her, they would apply to her in French. Um, there are plans for a Canuck TV channel. Um, at the moment, um, there are two local channels, but they're really anything but local. You hardly any ever see a Canuck face on, on local TV or any, any kind of TV. Um, while I was there, there was a documentary about the penal colony and, and a woman who, who was quite prominent in, in fighting uh, for convicts' rights um, who got together with some of the local people. and. There were some kind of people on TV, and, and the, 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 the children of the house where I was staying were, when they saw American films, are very interested in seeing black faces on TV because you know they hardly ever see anyone who looks like them on TV, which again is interesting, subliminal, and no wonder there's a lot of uh, educational underachievement. Um, okay, so this kind of TV channel, like like the um, like the lessons. Uh, uh, are going to be about language and culture, not necessarily in the languages. Yeah, and this is partly because the linguistic diversity is perceived as a problem. And um, I, I talking to um, French immigrants in the capital, uh, one of them said to me, for example, "Well, I would learn a local language, but there are so many of them." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what you get, um, what is still very important in in. Um, in New Caledonia is what's called the customary gesture. Um, has anyone here been to Vanuatu? I think some people, I think, yeah. Okay, uh, do, do you, I, I know they talk about custom there. I'm not sure it's exactly the same thing. Um, when you go to somebody's house, um, especially me as a linguist wanting something from them, it, there's a kind of exchange idea. This comes up in Papua, Papua New Guinea as well. Um, and, and you have to ask permission to, to go and talk to people in their house and you have to take along um, some presents, generally some cloth which is gen bought from the Chinese um, in town um, in particular kind, yeah, <laughs> particular, particular pat kind of patterns um, and a bit of money as well generally or something, uh, they like it if you bring something from home um, so I would go along uh, with Aurelie and there's a particular form of words which ought to be in, in indigenous languages but generally now is in French, and it's in, and you kind of stand like, and you, and you have your hands down, and, you, and your and your arms kind of by your side like that, um, um, and you say this form of words. So how we um, please uh, uh, let us come to your house, and we're very grateful. Um, but it's in, in, and and it, it creates obligations on both sides, so that I'm not expected to go back, and and every time I go back, it's, uh, if they've accepted my gift, they have to welcome me into their homes. Okay, um, and, but people give you things back. I've got something. Yeah. I've, got, I've got quite a few things people gave me, like flip flops, which is <laughs> interesting because they're in the shape of the uh, sort of feet that people have there. Um, this, this, um, in, as well as the traditional cloth, people get people give things like this. I'm so sorry, I've not even. Okay. Sure so this, this is this is um, uh, like you see, it's a map of New Caledonia. Um, and it's, it's, it's in the colours of the Kanak flag, which is um, almost officially recognised now. Um, okay, uh, um, I'll put that on the table for people to have a look at in a minute, perhaps. Okay. Um, but this is... Sorry. 
And I was also, I was also given a, uh, what's the English, pario, what's, um, sarong, um, which is, again, it's in the tradition of cloth, but it's not quite the traditional um, um, uh, customary gesture, and, which is quite interesting. Uh, also a mug <laughs> with a map of New Caledonia on. Um, yeah, um, but when I went to the school um, and I started trying to do the customary gesture to, to the teachers, they said, oh, save that for the elders. <laughs> which I thought was very interesting, because most of the other people that I'd been to, um, middle-aged and up, were, were very keen, overtly keen, keen on, on this customary gesture. Okay, um, and this is it going on at the, can you certainly see this very well, at the um, Kanak Languages Academy. Um, you can see down here you've got some of this uh, traditional, so-called traditional cloth that people give. And in, in a, a long time ago it wouldn't have been cloth, they didn't actually have cloth. Um, and you can see on top, of, on top of this, this is a model of, of a traditional house. This is, this is actually a, a tourist souvenir, but it's something that people give as part of the customary gesture. And this is actually being handed round at, at the Kanak Languages Academy, um, successively to the most senior person there, and eventually it was given to uh, someone from the Ministry of, Ministry of Education. Um, and people said to him afterwards, you do realise what you've done here by accepting this, you've got to basically do what they say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, all right. But in the background, this is Wendy Koehage, who is, who, who is the head of the Kanak Languages Academy. And this is one of this is one of the representatives. Um, they they have uh, representatives of the Languages Academy, which are responsible for um, language development in each of the areas. And they are more or less, um, or, or variously affect. Um, let's say different. They have different degrees of effectiveness with these people. And there's a huge arguments going on at the Languages Academy about that. Okay, um, yeah, so I went to a meeting at the Connect Languages Academy, um, which was actually for its fifth anniversary, and it was um, attempting to um, um, sort of discuss what had been achieved in, or take a balance of what has been achieved in, in the last, in the five years since it had been, it had been started. Um, it was eventually founded in 2007 under the new mayor accord, that is um, nearly 10 years after that particular accord, 1998 accord. And its main names are, and I've, I've deliberately put these bracket, inver, inverted comma brackets in the French style because I really think it is following the sort of French idea of centralization of language policy. Um, to, to fix the rules of usage and to contribute to promoting and developing Kanak languages and dialects, which comes secondary. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But the university student I spoke to, I spoke to a couple of them, um, we're, 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 they said, oh, it will definitely raise the status of our languages. And it has in terms of making them more visible in all these road signs and things are partly due to them. Um, and also developing orthographies for the languages. There, there's a view. Um, when you talk to people, people tend to assume that the orthographies that are being developed for certain languages, they're fo focusing on four uh, main languages, I mean, especially the, some of those from the islands because they tend to be the best ma maintained. Um, yeah, so there's not much hope at the moment of church being covered by the Language Academy because um, it's so small, um, which is why already is working on it particularly. Um, the propositions for orthographies developed by the Languages Academy tend to be seen as authoritative by people in the communities, but the Language Academy um, stresses that they're actually only propositions. Um, and that there's a lot of argument going on about orthography, as there is in quite a lot of places. Um, the Language Academy um, is of the opinion that a lot of documentary work has actually been done, particularly for the languages they're focusing on, so that they can now move from codification to normalization um, of selected languages. Um, and they do tend to be rather fixated on norms, um, in my view. Um, they talk about the problématique de normalisation graphique, the problem, problems of, of, of standardizing spelling, basically, in, in connect languages. Um, and really, writing is seen as preeminent, um, although there is very little literacy in Kanak languages. Um, they're really mainly oral languages. Um, but writing, 
writing is, and this is, these are quotes from people who were at the Language Academy meeting, writing can rectify the oral which can deform language usage. They, you know, they, they really want some kind of standard, yeah. which worries me slightly. Um, these are some of the materials, I've got some on the table as well, some of you had a little look at them this morning. Um, we didn't really focus on these though. Um, some of the materials which are produced by, by the Language Academy, they've got videos, um, you know, quite nice stuff. Uh, children's books, including one in Futunan, uh, because they don't, they, you know, they, they don't forget that there are quite a lot of kids who, who don't speak indigenous languages. Um, some here in French as well, um, and various worksheets for working on languages. Um, and they're all very nice, but, there's always a but with me, because I'm, I'm critical, as some of you know. Um, um, there's not a lot of liaison between the, language, the linguists working for the Language Academy and teachers or, or people, basic curriculum developers. Um, so they produce these materials without a lot of thought about how they're going to fit into the curriculum. Um, um, this is a little pun here, of course, spelling trouble. Um, so my question is, what and who are they preparing these language materials for? Because most people in New Caledonia are literate through French only, um, and there are no plans to introduce literacy through the language, local languages, even though, as I mentioned, there is actually a ready-made curriculum that they could draw on if they wanted to, um, coming from, from the, um, the epic card, the... the um, um, education system developed by the rebels back in the 80s, but that's a bit of a no-no. Hope we don't mention that. Um, and also, ordinary people tend to find the linguist spellings quite difficult to process. In fact, there's pretty well only linguists who can manage to use them. <laughs> um, so people do try texting in the, in the local languages. As I mentioned, um, people text quite a lot using their mobile phones. Um, people, I, I haven't got any examples of this because um, people don't have smartphones but, um, um, anyway, so it's difficult to collect texts. But people say um, that they text in the way it sounds to me, i.e. using French spelling because that's how they're educated. Yeah, um, but at the same time, there's literally religious attachment. Um, there's a, um, a linguist who lives there called Jacqueline da Fontinelle, who's very critical of the orthography for, um, um, policy of the um, uh, Academy of Lankanak. Um, some uh, some Protestant missionaries um, introduced introduced spellings, um, you know, back back a hundred years ago, um, which um, in some cases the academy would like to reform um, because they're not seen as as as, as very um, um, efficient uh, um, spelling systems. Um, but people are, and, and Jacqueline de Fontenelle, who she she gave this great tirade at the at the, <laughs> at the academy meeting, and she, and she was saying, just get on and write, you know, don't uh, and speak, don't worry about the tr don't worry about your accents, don't worry about the spelling, just, just do it. Um, and someone responds to that, well, how can we pronounce words correctly without the tremor? Which is the little two dots on top of some, you know, and, and there's a lot of these accents, they mean, they, 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 are, they um, um, represent things like length, a vowel length and nasalization and all, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, so as I said, this is fun of fixation on standardization and, and on the written language. Uh, although most of the language is not actually written yet. So in conclusion, um, um, well not exactly, we are, anyway, um, I think there has been not very much sociolinguistic research done at all in New Caledonia, in fact not, not a lot in the Pacific altogether. Um, there's been some language documentation done, as I said, in, in the view of the Language Academy, um, some languages are fairly thoroughly documented, and not by no means all of them, though, in New Caledonia. Um, there's also been a fair amount of anthropological work done um, on, well, a fair amount, some anthropological work done on, on traditional culture. Um, I, in terms of other sociolinguistic research, all I know about is one undergraduate project, one of the, one of the students I talked to, who I interviewed some people or did a little questionnaire in the village about language shift. So I think there's quite a lot of work, um, um, particular language attitudes to be done, actually, and Arlene is quite interested in doing some work with me on that. Um, I also feel um, that the linguists who are developing materials, and I did talk to some of them as well, um, don't have much knowledge about, about language education, about <coughs> education in general, about applied linguistics. And as some of you know, I'm quite keen for linguists to work with applied linguists on developing language materials rather than doing it in a way which isn't terrifically useful. Um, 
<clears throat> to, particularly there's not a lot of, no of knowledge of how people actually develop literacy and, and how people learn to write. Um, and there's very much an autonomous or technocratic view of literacy development and orthography development, not taking um, ideological and, and cultural practices into account when developing spelling systems or what the people are going to use the language they're writing for, in other words. So I think there's quite a lot of scope for, for, for training collaboration in that respect as well. Um, and as Itesh said, um, as it says on the back of my book, I think it's very important to understand and address language ideologies and attitudes um, when trying to promote uh, low status languages. Uh, because if you don't tackle the underlying reasons for language shift, then they're really not going to not gonna be very effective in, in terms of language maintenance. Um, this is a quote from... Um, um, a couple of people that I interviewed, this is a married couple. Um, the, the, the husband was, uh, he said, after we'd finished discussing um, um, stuff, I mean, kind of, kind of end, ending up the, the interview, he said, discussing this makes us look at ourselves in a mirror, discussing things like this, because they'd never really talked about language attitudes before. And Gigi, his wife, said, and when we look in the mirror, we see blemishes, um, which I thought quite quite interesting comment. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's, that's the end of my talk. I'm um, just show you, sorry, <laughs> picture. <laughs> okay. so you this, this is the Centre Cultural Chibao, which was named after the, the Kanak leader who was assassinated. And this is the home of the Kanak Languages Academy. It's a cultural centre which um, is on the outskirts of the capital. You can see the capital in the background there on the other side of the bay. Um, and it aims to... Um, it was been designed by Renzo Piano, a famous architect, and it, it, the idea is to bring together both traditional and, and, and modern, i.e. French, influences. So they have um, sort of cultural events and yeah, lots of stuff. You know. yeah, that's Thank it. you, Julia. And the uh, bibliography, yeah. I, I read stuff. I have uh, many questions from Julia about things like, you know, where did she get the money to go to this one? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> My <laughs> credit card. Train, <laughs> <down>. <laughs> yeah. But I won't ask those questions. I think the important ones are the ones to the aspects that you cover today, social, linguistic, identity, culture, and the languages. What was yours? Any, any questions? Yes, thank you for a very interesting talk. And I'm interested to know what you particularly want to do next. What's okay. your sort of, oh, I'd really like to research this, and okay. where do you hope to start? Yeah, I would like to do more in, more research, and I, this is really a very, very, very small pilot study. I would like to do more research into language attitudes and ideologies there, um, as I said in, 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 the, in, the, in the end slide. In particular, uh, I want to try and collaborate with Aurélie Cochard and, and um, the guy whose initials are JM there, um, who, who's the one who did a, um, a BA and an MA on, 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 on traditional culture, to, to look at language and cultural shift um, yeah, and attitudes towards that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's very difficult to get money for things like that, so unfortunately I've, 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 I've been looking. So, yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, can, I, can I ask a follow up question on the development of, of um, orthographies and written material? reading material, mm -hmm. because you were saying that it's not clear actually what the purpose is, who would be yeah. the yeah. Um And that's, that's a very interesting question, but I was wondering whether you had thoughts as a social linguist in the situation, what potential readers would be, and to, to what extent the development of, of reading materials and orthographies is, is a useful investment of time, yeah. or whether people are quite happy actually reading and writing in French, and that's, that's so ingrained. Mm -hmm. That it's it's you know it's a less symbolic mm -hmm. value maybe to have a writing system but a practical part yeah. of your life is that anybody's ever going to use it. Yeah, I think you're quite right, yes. Um I think that's, this is something to be discussed with, and this is something that isn't happening, is discussing with people what they would actually like to do if, with reading and writing the languages. Um, the people who've developed uh, these Protestant orthographies are very keen on, on Bible translation. Um, Interestingly, the, 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 the local language is still not used in the Catholic Church. Um, and in fact, the priest in Puebla actually comes from Vanuatu. Um, um, he's a, he's a, he's a French speaker from Vanuatu, well, he's Francophone Vanuatuan. Um, and so he doesn't speak any of the local languages, and everything is through French there. Um, but there's quite a lot of, French, of, of church spoken around and about. So yes, they are, they are still mainly oral languages. And the question is, as you say, what purpose will be served? 
um, as you say, mostly symbolic, I think, with regard to things like place names. Um, I think place names are actually quite important for, for cultural survival and, and, um, and um, um, developing the, um, so with the um, self-confidence of, of indigenous people. Um, going back to the talk that, that Jeanette King did at the beginning of term, I, I, do, I do think that um, um, so it's a confidence in traditional culture, um, improving um, people's self-confidence in general is a very important aspect of, of language and, and cultural revitalization. And as I said, um, there is quite a high level of alcoholism, drug use, and, and basic kind of underachievement in the indigenous population. And if, um, by promoting local languages, one can help to promote a bit of pride am among people, that I think would be very helpful. I think this is the case in Australia as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Tim? Yeah. More comment on the question. I was interested in the fact that you were saying that French is the lingua franca. Mm. Well, yes, but um, I think that's also the case in Gabon, in okay. Africa. But, okay. you know, yeah. That's another fairly small French, ex French colony. Yeah. As far as I know, it's the only uh, African French country that has that situation. Uh -huh. I mean, might be some interesting comparisons there. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I know some people, well, I know. Friends of friends who've been doing work in Gabon, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. But is, it, okay, thank is, you. is Gabon French? Well, I mean, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ex French colony. Ex French, but this yeah. one isn't ex French. No, well, this is still, still French. Still French, yes. But I don't know why they're clinging on to it quite. Perhaps it's in the nickel, they, you know, they're clinging on, really <laughs> clinging on to it. <laughs> but I think that's about it. But I mean, it's quite small, there's only about sort of 4 million Gabonese. Yeah, well, there's even, even fewer New Caledonians. Of course, there's even been other countries in West Africa anyway, so. Yeah. The question is obvious, and because it's still French, yeah. and given mm. that the French education system does not promote mm. linguistic diversity, whether it's in mainland, in, yes, or anywhere, yeah. or else, that <laughs> yeah. must have massive implications for the kind of Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. odd that actually, I mean, it's not surprising to some degree that the activists don't really get too far. Yeah, yeah. Because the, all the institutional yeah. support and control yeah. is not yeah. really in their hands. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> But it's got more, I'm sure, in sending out all those other expressions. Well, I mean, it's, okay. it's interesting. I'm sorry. It's okay. Might, might be going to the early history of Senegal, with the, the first president there, I mean, he, uh, Senghor, he was very into French. That's right. Mm. Um, and the official language is French, but all the same, Wolof is a widely wide spoken lingua franca. Yes, yes, yeah. It's, it's, it's a different situation. There was never a widely spoken lingua franca in, in New Caledonia. There was this sort of language, uh, sort of dialect continua. Okay. Carolina? wondering with regard to the education system and the fact that it's still mainly done for French, do they have their specific sort of literacy materials for, for children or is it all based on French curriculum or French It is all based on French curriculum. I mean, none of these materials are actually used in schools, I'm afraid. Um, yeah. they basically, you know, the sort of basic literacy would be, you know, this is France, this is Paris, blah, blah, blah. So I'm wondering whether they did any sort of adaptation to the cultural reality, as it were, no. or do they still teach children about where Paris is? Yeah. And baguettes, and camembert. Yeah, if you're lucky, you'll, you'll, you'll find some baguette and camembert. I mean, the, the, this capital, Le Mer, is a rather unattractive French town. It is very much a French <laughs> town. Um, you really see very, apart from a few people, you see very little Canuck presence there. Um, yeah. 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 Oh, um, you know, you said about increasing the national pride and yeah. increasing the pride of the people yeah. in their own mm -hmm. language and their own mm -hmm. culture, as it were. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, you know, films with, you know, actors who look yeah. like the people themselves might yeah. be beneficial. Yeah. What yeah. other things would you say, or oh, what, what other steps? or you know, first baby steps might be good to take in, the, the, in situations like that. There was a session on this at the, at the Languages Academy. They had, they, they had someone over from Tahiti. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, no, no. They, they actually, they had someone who just joined the, the um, New Caledonian Broadcasting Authority from Tahiti. And Tahiti is about 20 years ahead of New Caledonia in language policy, language maintenance, and stuff. So he, was, he, he had lots of interesting ideas um, about things like competition for young people, uh, writing songs, whatever. Um, yes, um, because I think I mean he's 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 keen on 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 engaging younger people. Because um, as 
um, in many places, um, there's a bit of kind of hyper traditionalizing going on with this kind of focus on oh we're we we're losing our culture. And and um, and I think there is a bit of a time bomb there with a huge number of young people and and sort of um, sort of dispossessedness feeling, yeah. What about languidness? Do they try and hear languidness like the Maoris? And yeah, they don't know much about it's Australia or New Zealand at all. Actually, uh, yeah, they they have no links with them. No, no. Um, that would be very interesting. Yes, that would be a very interesting thing to think about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Peter, yeah. So, question then. Sorry. Just one silly comment. There's actually tens of thousands of speakers of Spanish living in Australia. So oh yes, okay, so, okay, right. So they could they could speak Spanish with someone there. But if they if they even kind of acknowledge the existence of Australia, I mean, apart from tourists, they really have no link with Australia. No, that's yeah. actually my uh, yeah. my kind of question. Yeah. You didn't really yeah. broach this, but yeah. there are issues of attitudes and ideology mm. between francophonie and mm. the anglophone world. Well, mm. Now you come in, yeah. what's your perception? Are you a yeah. anglophone? Well you've clearly come from England. Here was or are you, yeah. you know, I, I position because yeah. there have been mm. in the past mm -hmm. quite some tensions between mm. the academic community, the mm. um, you know the policy makers and so on within this area. Mm and the Anglophones, yeah. so that yeah. you said they ignore Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. Exactly that, that is yeah. exactly the case. And yeah. um, it, it has been quite difficult in the past. And okay. So are some of those things that you're saying could simply be taken as crazy Anglophone? Or, or crazy person from outside. Um, with the Indigenous people, I did kind of try and position myself as, as another person from a Indigenous, a, a minority community, um, to kind of get over the the, the idea that I was um, um, sympathetic to to their point of view, um, and I was speaking French all the time. I didn't. I speak any English in New Caledonia. I do. I do speak French quite well, um, and yeah, they they would recognise that I wasn't French. But yeah, they thought I was Australian. But that didn't. That didn't. That what that that what that wasn't perceived in it as an issue. It might be more of an issue with uh, when one comes to interact with the um, other academics at work there who are doing language documentation because um, it's very much straight straight linguistics, no sociolinguistics. Um, and that might be a bit of a, of a clash and a problem. But um, there are some, like as I mentioned, uh, Professor La Fontinelle, who, who are quite open to this kind of ideas and to challenging this uh, kind of top-down model, particularly of orthography development. So there, yeah, there's, there's possibilities. <laughs> yeah. I did see your time with Condi. Uh, I was going to ask you, you showed us some maps of the linguistic... Should I, should I go back to that if I... Yeah. I was just curious if you, and you, your work has been, or these interviews have been with the uh, church people. Yeah, right up here, yeah. And then some yeah. other people in Numea, is that right? Yeah, uh, people in the mirror I talk to are at the Language Academy and um, people study, students from, church, from, from Pueblo studying the BA in Oceanic Languages at, at the University of New Caledonia and, and their tutor. So I was wondering about identity. So yeah. the question, the ideology and the link with identity, is it actually do people identify themselves as Fenac? And then language would be maybe not as important for this sense of identity, or are they mm. identifying themselves as chach? It's a very good question, and, and I can't speak for everyone, obviously, and, and it's, not, it's not a question I really went into, so I, I really can't answer that one. Um, I would guess that people identify themselves from their area, but also from the, from the Hutmawap area. Okay. 
from the from the for the traditional area rather than from kind of New Caledonia and also as Canucks. Um, and there's lots of, of, of possible pictures I could have showed you that I haven't. Um, um, there's a bridge in, 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 in Pueblo which still has from the 80s a bit of graffiti saying Kanaki Vakra, Kanaki will win. Kanaki is the, is the Kanak name for New Caledonia. Um, but this is a kind of, again, a, a sort of a modern concept as well to have the whole country. Um, obviously, in the past, um, people were fighting each other as well. Yeah. But some of this is from Chibao. Yes. 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 Exactly. Yes. 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 Yeah. I was just wondering uh, where English fits into this picture of language attitudes over there, because in Vanuatu, the Francophone ministers would go to great pains to not position New Caledonia as a great Francophone place when I was asking about French, English and all the other languages, but they would actually talk of it as a good bilingual example. By bilingual, they're meaning French and English. Really? It seems that it, it was becoming difficult <laughs> for Francophones in Vanuatu to justify French, that they would justify bilingualism, meaning English and French, would be a way of and so if you try and look at New Caledonia, they would say, well, that's a good example. It's not French only. They've still got English. And that they would always say that uh, New Caledonia is desperately looking to both French and English, rather than suggesting it was a good example of Francophonie, which is what I'd expected to see. But I don't know what it looks like from in New Caledonia, whether English is even talked about or... Uh, okay, probably getting beyond what I, what I, what I know about, but... Um, <laughs> From what I can see, that, that standard of English is not is not great. <laughs> um, it's what you might expect from people who have learned it at school, and um, they don't get a lot apart from the cruise ships, which really don't get anywhere except the capital, um, and they're not for very long. I mean, they um, they'll, they'll land for a couple of hours, go to the local market, perhaps visit one of the islands, and then they're off. Um, you know, and very few people will interact with with, with English speaking tourists. And satellite TV is it? It's, it's, all in, it's all in French, um, and badly dubbed a th a th Moroccan um, s uh, um, um, soap operas, and yeah, <laughs> it's all sorts of stuff that's highly irrelevant to the local community, but it's a load of rubbish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Alice. Uh, is there some sort of working language in the Nicolaitan language? I'm guessing it's French, but I don't know, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's not a... Yeah. It is, yeah. That company, whose name was mentioned, um, well, uh, largely, yeah. Um, um, but uh, that's that's out of my area of expertise, I'm afraid. Yeah, um, I'm guessing that they will. In, I'm, I'm, I think. I mean, I know there is an interest from Australia in New Caledonia, and I think it's largely because of, of the nickel deposits, and they would like to develop more more trade. But yeah, I mean, that, that's as far as I know. I'm afraid. Yeah. Uh, so I think a lot of Indonesian people work in the, in the <coughs> industry, is what I was told. Mm -hmm. uh, I was sort of more thinking on the, I don't know, higher levels, the trade or business. I couldn't tell you, I'm afraid. They're already French multinationals. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So, yeah. Um, among the indigenous languages, do people place hierarchy? Which one is, is the best? Or which Ooh. one sound intelligent? Or That's a very interesting question. Um, Again, I don't know. Um, the the Languages Academy has its own hierarchy in terms of what must be might, might be the most useful languages to develop orthographies for first, meaning the ones which are most widely spoken. Um, but apart from that, I, I think and um, people are, f are are quite attached to their own home languages, and they don't tend to learn other Kanak languages. Well, not nowadays, but um, yeah, but they tend to understand the lo the, the the nearby ones. Yeah. What happened to APK? Is it still? Uh, uh, yes. Sorry, is it sorry. Still no, 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 no. That 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 finished uh, when when the rebellion finished. Mm. They went back to to school. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, as I said, it's it's still very alive in people's memories. There's a lot of nostalgia going on for that area, <laughs> that that period. <laughs> mm. So just a question about the academy again. Then, mm. um, so is each language represented by? Person or several people or certain languages that represent. They they have a representative for each area, right. 
um, and that person is supposed Pardon? Yes, 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 the, the customary areas. Um, and that person is supposed to run local committees developing things like dictionaries and stuff um, and to be promoting the language. Um, in some, in some, and I say in some areas these people are more effective than others. So I think around the middle of the island there's, there's a local TV, uh, so radio station starting with stuff in, in, in some local languages different times of day. But um, I said there was a huge argument about this at the, at the academy meeting uh, about how some people were, were just simply not doing their job properly. But to be fair, the woman um, who, who, who runs an ordinance, she's got a huge area to cover, and it, it will take her all day to go from that round to there, you know? Yeah. Uh, are they paid represent? I mean, are they paid? I'm not so sure. I, um, um, yeah, people seem to have a lot of money, but they don't do a lot of work in <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, or, or they just they just get government money. Um, yeah. Gender issues are the difference between uh, young women, men and women who are pro or against. Um, it's a lot less sexist than than many other traditional um, 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 societies, I think. Um, but. Um, um, most of the people I talked to were female, and most of the people who were interested in language that I talked to were female, actually. And were they in French or...? In, in local languages, in local. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think that goes against some of it. At least there's some stuff in the literature about who yeah. promotes the war. Okay, yeah. The only but but, but as, 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 you know, as in many other things, you know, you go to the... Uh, um, the language academy and most of the people there, but and there, there are some women. You can see there are two women in there, and uh, 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 kind of the important people standing at the front. Yeah, no, and and the technical advisor is is a female linguist, a French linguist. Um, uh, the education minister person who came along there is 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 a, is a female. Yeah.